10, 9, Cigarettes and rocket fuel. Suck it to me, five, baby. 5, 4, 3, 2, We choose one, to go to the moon. Zero. All engines running. Commit. We choose to go to the lift moon. Lift off. We have lift off at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. All on here. Let's go all the way. Everything looks good. Roger. All right. Copy. KHCN AM 4747, Houston, Texas. News you can use and talk that matters. There's a lot going for you in Chronicle Business, Oil and Gas. The Houston Chronicle. The Houston Chronicle. The Chronicle gives you the last word on how they closed on the big board, the other exchanges, over the counter. Late quotes on commodities, livestock, financial stocks. Get more news on what's happening in Houston's business world, oil and gas, real estate, and agriculture. Get the Chronicle Business Oil and Gas going for you. There's a lot going for you in the Chronicle. The Houston Chronicle. Subscribe now. Call Capital 42061. Today is Easter Sunday, April 6, 1969. Tim's timepiece is time. The tone is 2 p.m. If your timepiece is right only twice a day, get down to Tim's timepieces in Rice Village. Good afternoon. I'm Steve Schaefer with a recap of the week's news you can use. We start with breaking information on a remarkable story at St. Luke's Episcopal Hospital in Houston. KHCN has learned that a donor heart has been found for 47-year-old Haskell Karp, who is presently being kept alive by a mechanical heart that was implanted in a first-of-its-kind procedure. The artificial heart, described as an 8-ounce plastic pump, was attached by Dr. Denton A. Cooley to a remnant of Karp's heart after the surgeon was unable to repair major damage to the diseased organ. Carp of Skokie, Illinois, has been alert and able to respond to commands such as moving his hands and toes. But Dr. Cooley said the artificial heart realistically could function for only a week to 10 days and that a donor heart would ultimately be necessary to preserve Carp's life. Carp's wife gave a handwritten request to news media and also appeared on television to plea for what she called a God-given heart for her husband. Sources tell us that donor, who has yet to be identified, is being flown to Houston today for a transplant procedure that Cooley hopes to perform tomorrow. Former U.S. President Dwight D. Eisenhower, who died on March 28th, was laid to rest last week in an $80 GI coffin in Abilene, Kansas. Houston City Councilmen are considering naming Intercontinental Airport, which is set to open on June 8th, after the late Commander-in-Chief. Mayor Louis Welch said he does not object to naming the airport after Eisenhower, but thinks a park might serve as a more permanent memorial. Also locally, the Port of Houston is bustling again after the end of a 103-day longshoreman strike. A new contract for union clerks and shippers ended the longest and costliest dock walkout in history. A year after civil rights leader Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated in Memphis, services, marches, and vigils were held Friday and Saturday in hundreds of cities and towns throughout the country. Here in Houston, State Senator Barbara Jordan spoke Friday afternoon at a memorial rally at City Hall attended by approximately 200 people, both black and white. As the war rages on in Vietnam, where the American death toll now exceeds that of the Korean War, a federal judge ruled Tuesday that the Selective Service Act of 1967 is unconstitutional because it does not grant draft exemptions to men who are conscientious objectors on non-religious grounds. The government is expected to appeal the decision. Texas Senator Ralph Yarbrough has called for a ban on the pesticide DDT, which he calls poisonous, and said Friday that air pollution, not nuclear war, is the prime threat to humanity's long-term welfare. Yarbrough also said that waste burning is increasing pollution, which could make the world too hot. Dick and Tom Smothers plan to sue CBS after the television network announced the cancellation of the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour last week. This is the latest move in a battle over what the network calls good taste, and the comedic siblings call censorship. Beatle George Harrison and his wife Patty paid fines of 250 pounds each, that equates to roughly $1,200 total, after pleading guilty to having marijuana in their home in England, said the 26-year-old guitarist, quote, we hope the police will now leave the Beatles alone, unquote. Finally, Astros owner Roy Hoffines dropped his lawsuit against Major League Baseball, filed after the team did not get first baseman Don Clendenin as agreed upon in a winter trade between the Astros and Montreal Expos. After being dealt to Houston for outfielder Rusty Staub, Clendenin announced his retirement, but Commissioner Bowie Kuhn upheld the deal and Staub insisted he would not return to Houston. After a suddenly unretired Clendenin signed on Wednesday with the Expos, who had selected him from the Pittsburgh Pirates in the expansion draft, Montreal on Thursday sent pitchers Jack Billingham and Skip Gwynn to the Astros as mutual compensation, 
prompting Hoffines to drop his suit. The Astros open their season on the road Tuesday as the first opponent of the expansion San Diego Padres. Coming up next, Alex Stuckey and Andrew Dansby recount the week's space race news and look back on Project Mercury and its foundational importance to the Apollo program. For KHCN, I'm Steve Schaefer. You are listening to KHCN AM 4747, Houston, Texas. News you can use and talk that matters. Thanks, Steve, and welcome back to Space Talk Sunday with Alex and Andy. Today, as NASA charges toward the May 17th launch of Apollo 10, Andy and I decided to take a step back and help y'all, and especially you newcomers. Welcome to Space City. Understand how we got here just a couple months away from attempting a moon landing. Of course, it all started with the launch of the Kami Sputnik satellite in 1957. We told you all about that last week. But we're going to talk about how we got into the space game. Andy? That's right, Alex. Project Mercury was the name, and putting a man in space was the game. It started in 1958, the same year our late president, Dwight Eisenhower, God rest his soul, established NASA. The goals were straightforward. Simply orbit a manned spacecraft around Earth, investigate a man's ability to function in space, and recover both man and spacecraft safely. Accomplishing all that was anything but simple. When America started the Mercury Project, we had no idea how to do any of it. We were desperate to catch up to the Soviets, and they had a big lead in the space race. Some doctors thought that a man would not survive the space environment. The tremendous forces on the body during launch, weightlessness, and the heat of reentry. They thought the astronauts might swallow their own tongues, not to mention the radiation belts, solar winds, meteorites out of nowhere, and whatever unknown cosmic forces there might be. Anyways, NASA selected its first seven astronauts in 1959. John Glenn, Scott Carpenter, Gordon Cooper, Gus Grissom, Wally Schirra, Alan Shepard, and Deke Slayton. True American heroes, the best of the best. Those seven were selected from an original group of some 500 test pilots from all branches of the military. Every test pilot was considered. Of course, there were no women. We can't be test pilots. They had to have an engineering background, be younger than 40, be a graduate of one of the test pilot schools, and be 5'11 or less. And, this is important, they had to volunteer. 110 men met those qualifications. They were all interviewed, grilled, I imagine, and NASA got it down to 32 men. Then, those men were put through an exhaustive series of tests at bases in Arizona and Ohio. The testing measured their ability to withstand physical challenges. They were given batteries of psychological and physiological tests. How did they react to the effects of G's while spinning around on a human centrifuge? And how did they feel about it? Glad they don't have one of those human centrifuge machines at Astro World. The men were put through treadmill tests, had their feet plunged into ice water, more centrifuges, flight simulations. They got whirled around in all sorts of crazy contraptions, had doses of castor oil and castor oil. Well, you know what that does. The lab technicians and doctors tested memory, decision making under pressure, heat, stress, confined spaces, more things than you or I could ever imagine. They were lab rats. Everything, every test was documented, compared, and studied, one man versus another. And after all that, the director of NASA's Space Task Group couldn't get it down to the six men they were looking for, so he picked seven. Once the seven were selected and introduced to America, the real training and testing began. First, NASA had to make sure everything was safe, or as safe as it could be, before strapping a man to a rocket and shooting him out of Earth's atmosphere. You know, they conducted unmanned tests of the booster and the capsule with the chimpanzee aboard. Fun fact, the chimp's name was Ham. More importantly, he survived, unlike that poor Soviet space dog Laika on Mm. Sputnik 2. Folks, I see Scotty telling me it's time for a quick message. Don't go away. You're listening to KHCN AM 4747 Houston, Texas. News you can use and talk that matters. Astroworld is now open weekends. Astroworld is the Southwest's largest family amusement and entertainment center. Designed for fun. 57 acres of thrilling rides and lively shows. See all the fantastic attractions. The Astro Needle, a 340-foot high spiral tower. The tallest amusement ride in the world. And the Astro Wheel, a kind of Ferris wheel you won't find anywhere else. Take the Alpine sleigh ride through a snowstorm, down a glacier, and right past the abominable snowman. Brrrr. See the mill pond with its one-of-a-kind water-skimming dodgem cars. Drive a mod sports car in Spin Out. 
and enjoy the taxi antique car rides through Gay Paris and the Alps. <laughs> and don't forget the Crystal Palace with 10 live shows daily. Marvel McFay can't wait to entertain you. And new for 1969, the fantastic bamboo shoot water ride. There won't be a dry seat in the place. And, you know, Astroworld is just the coolest. In more ways than one, the entire park is air-conditioned. From the buildings and shops to the waiting areas, picnic spots, and many of the rides themselves. Astroworld is open now for the spring season. Fridays, 6 p.m. to 10 p.m., adults 350, children 250. Saturdays and Sundays, 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. Adults 450, and the kids are just 350. See you soon at Astroworld, the wonderful world of fun. Thanks for sticking with us through the break, folks. Andy and I are talking about the Mercury Project, America's first human spaceflight endeavor. Before we move on to the rocket, as promised, just a couple more things about the astronauts that I know you'll be interested in. Okay, shoot, Alex. Money. At the time, there was a proposal that the astronaut job become a civil service position. Federal employees, grades 12 to 15, which meant they made $8,333 at grade 12, up to 12770 at the top of the scale. Not too shabby. And they'd earn every penny. Get a load of the description of an astronaut. Although the entire satellite operation will be possible in the early phases without the presence of man, the astronaut will play an important role during the flight. Then there's a bunch of bureaucratic jibber-jabber. Then, in addition, the astronaut will make research observations that cannot be made by instruments. Those include physiological, astronomical, and meteorological observations. Yep, that's the job. You got to put a human into space to do that. And fun fact. I knew it. The civil service panel thought they had coined the term astronaut, but it had been used in science fiction since the 1920s. Goes to show there's nothing new under the sun, Alex. Speaking of big money, let's talk about the launch vehicle program. The Mercury Atlas launch vehicle, built by Convair, of course, was a modified intercontinental ballistic missile. The Atlas was specced and built out well enough to carry a weapon, but they gave her a rework top to bottom to get the rocket up to human rated for reliability. After the Atlas was chosen as the launch vehicle to be used for our first manned space flights in early 1959, the Mercury astronauts were taken out to watch an Atlas test launch. That Atlas blew up about a minute into flight. I'd love to have heard the conversation around the dinner table when those seven men got back home. Can't get into all of it today, but one of the most brilliant engineering things here is the escape system. Engineers developed a set of engines on the very tip top that would automatically pull the capsule away from the main body of the rocket should they need to abort the mission at the launch pad or during any of the early moments of the flight. You might remember, they used Little Joes to test the escape tower system. One of them came apart after launch and blew up, but it was a good test of the new escape system, reassuring NASA it would work if the rocket had a big problem, which the Little Joe did. Onto the capsule. You know, it's about the size of a Volkswagen Beetle. It's about 11 feet long and 6 feet wide, with like 100 cubic feet of human space inside. There were 120 controls. That's 55 electrical switches, 30 fuses, and 35 mechanical levers. After a lot of testing and a couple of different versions, NASA finally settled on McDonnell Aircraft in St. Louis to build it. Altogether, the Atlas rocket and the capsule, with the escape tower, were about 95 feet tall at launch. That's about a third the height of a Saturn V, just to give you an idea. Project Mercury scheduled six manned flights, and they were all successful, each progressively more difficult or more useful for scientific purposes. Remember, the goal was to catch up to the commies, and fast. It was neck and neck. They sent up Yuri Gagarin in April 1961. Then we sent up Alan Shepard in May, and the race was on. By the time of the sixth and final Mercury flight in May 1963, we were closing the gap, but still behind. Speaking of behinds, we're behind on our commercial breaks. Be right back. Yoo-hoo, movie fans! Enter the Houston Post 5th Annual Oscar Contest. You saw all the shows. What do you think? This week, we're jogging your memory about best actor and actress in a supporting role. Jack Albertson in The Subject Was Roses, Seymour Cassell in Faces, Daniel Massey in Star, Jack Wilde in Oliver, Gene Wilder in The Producers. And how about those leading ladies? Lynn Carlin in Faces, Ruth Gordon in Rosemary's Baby, Sandra Locke in The Heart is a Lonely Hunter, Kay Medford in Funny Girl, 
and Estelle Parsons in Rachel Rachel. And best song. I love all these songs. Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, For the Love of Ivy, Funny Girl, Star, and the Windmills of Your Mind from the Thomas Crown Affair. How about best achievement in direction? Gilo Pontecorvo, The Battle of Algiers, Franco Zeffirelli, Romeo and Juliet, Anthony Harvey, The Lion and Winter, Carol Reed, Oliver, and Stanley Kubrick, 2001, A Space Odyssey. Boom, 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 boom. Your official entry form available in today's Houston Post must be postmarked by midnight April 13th for you to be eligible to win a 69 Pontiac Firebird. Courtesy of Frizzell's Pontiac City, 3040 Woodridge, right next to Globe and Golf Gate. See the entry for the official rules and a list of the other 48 prizes you can win. One entry per person, please. You're listening to KHCN AM 4747, Houston, Texas. News you can use and talk that matters. We're back. We're talking about the manned Mercury flights. Let's break those down. They were all important, you know, but a couple of flights were more significant than the others. On May 5th, 1961, Alan B. Shepard Jr. strapped into the Freedom 7 spacecraft to become the first American in space. There was a little bit of a delay in the launch, three hours, and Shepard was eager to go, and maybe just a little impatient when he radioed, why don't you fix your little problem and light this candle? Wow, no fear. Just what you'd expect from him, I guess. That's why Shepard was picked to be the first man in space. He spent 15 minutes and 28 seconds in flight, from liftoff to splashdown, short and sweet. Can't even begin to comprehend how thrilling and terrifying that flight must have been. Thanks to the success of Shepard's mission, NASA didn't waste any time. Two months later, on July 21st, 1961, Gus Grissom went up in the capsule he named Liberty Bell 7. He stayed up there for 15 minutes and 37 seconds. The mission was successful, except the hatch somehow blew off after splashdown and Liberty Bell sunk into the ocean. He got out okay, of course, but... You bet, Alex, it took NASA seven months to do the next flight. And that third man mission was John Glenn and Friendship 7 on February 20th, 1962. He became the first American to orbit Earth, spending almost five hours in space, orbiting Earth three times. Glenn's flight showed the Reds we could finally compete in the space race. Glenn's flight wasn't perfect either. First, he had trouble with an automatic control system. He handled that. Then there was a problem with the heat shield, or so they thought. A signal from the capsule indicated that the heat shield might be loose, but the signal ended up being faulty, and in the end, the heat shield performed up to spec. Doesn't change the fact that it was a tense moment for everyone involved. There were three more manned missions as part of Project Mercury, the last being Gordon Cooper in Phase 7 in May 1963. His mission lasted 34 hours and 19 minutes. That's more than a full day. Seems like such a short amount of time considering Apollo missions now last 10 days, but back then, spending 34 hours crammed into that capsule probably felt like 10 days. Everyone is looking forward to this summer when Apollo, whichever mission gets there first, touches down. And an American is first to walk. And an American is first to walk on the moon. Truly an incredible feat. And we'll do it, God willing. I hope today's look back at Project Mercury reminds y'all just how much has been accomplished and how quickly those achievements have happened. Rockets built for war have been redesigned for the peaceful exploration of our closest heavenly neighbor. New rockets, capsules, computers, and construction techniques have been invented and put into use. And those computers and every material process, training technique, and protocol has been examined and tested and improved upon with every step forward. Project Mercury was meant to discover how, if, a human man could withstand space travel. Is the United States capable of building a vehicle durable and reliable enough to safely put those brave men into space and bring them back alive? Of course, the answers to those questions and many others was a rousing yes. Time Magazine had it right. Those men are Columbus, Magellan, Daniel Boone, and the Wright brothers, all rolled into one. Next week, we'll dig into the Gemini program, the bridge program between Mercury and Apollo. Gemini had 10 crewed missions and put 20 men into orbit and was meant to test both men and machine. With long-duration flights, testing our ability to maneuver a spacecraft, or even two, and achieve rendezvous with a target vehicle and dock while in Earth's orbit. The Gemini astronauts performed spacewalks and completed tasks. Space stands for photography and perfected the techniques needed for safe re-entry into the atmosphere and recovery procedures. 
all of this work provided the training and experience needed for both the ground crews and the astronauts as NASA pushed toward the moon. Wow, Alex. Big week next week. And then? Andy, you'll just have to show up for work to find out. Apollo? You bet your bippy. There's so much to talk about with the Apollo program. By the time Apollo 10 lifts off in May, folks, well, y'all will be official space experts. See you next week. God bless. Bottoms make the scene. The young men of today know all of the great new looks and pants are bold bell bottoms. Pally Royal has collected all of the excitement in a great bunch of styles of the moment, including the newest Jam Jams, Bright as the Beach Sunlight, Paw Prints, Boss Stripes, and Dashing Dressy Solids. Assorted fabrics for summer in boys sizes 8 to 12 and young men's waist 28 to 36. Priced 5 to $17 at all Palais Royal stores except downtown and village. Happy Easter. I'm Miss Amber and this is Space City Social. Former First Lady Jackie Onassis, Nee Kennedy, brought her former mother-in-law, the Mrs. Rose Kennedy, to the Bahamas aboard the yacht belonging to her new husband, Aristotle Onassis. Can you imagine? The new Mrs. Onassis and the elder Mrs. Kennedy were spotted walking down the island's famous Bay Street in Nassau. If you're a fan of Angela Lansbury, I have good news. The actress, who currently stars in the Dear World musical on Broadway, has been cast as the lead in The Dreamers. Bravo, Miss Lansbury. The feature-length film will be shot near Munich in Germany. How exotic. While the nation mourns President Eisenhower's passing, State Senator Barbara Jordan has a message for Houstonians. She spoke at a Bayou City memorial service for the late Dr. Martin Luther King and had this to say. So I say to every black Houstonian today, do not weep and do not hate. What I say to you is stand firm, united in a cause that is just. Do not be divided. Let us move towards the unified goal of an America where every man will be free and be what he desires to be. I say to white Houstonians that this is not a time. This is not a moment for you to advise or admonish the black community. This is not a moment to moralize about what the black students on our college campuses are doing. This is not a time for you to make us to become defensive about the posture that we are asserting in many places in this country. But this is a time for white Houstonians to accede to black Houstonians the right of the dignity of their personalities, the right for them to proceed in the manner they see best to bring about the kind of open and just and honorable society so that all of us can live together as brothers. This is the testimony of Martin Luther King. Well said, Senator Jordan. Attention, Houstonian to Acapulco. Mr. Acapulco himself, a.k.a. Mr. Teddy Stauffer, owner of the Villa Vera and that little Mexican beach town, will be here for this week's River Oaks tennis tourney. It's a great opportunity to ask Teddy for a prime hotel reservation. If Europe is more your scene, Susie says that Rome is where all the royal action is. We aren't naming any names, but she hinted that a number of princesses, counts and countesses, plus a certain king of Morocco, are all headed that way. Happy spring break, y'all. Ladies, Palais Royal has a deal for you. Now you can carry one beautiful bag in three delightful ways. And as a bonus, the reversible clutch is covered in tiny caviar beads and costs just $19. Happy shopping. Let's talk next week. You've been listening to KHCN AM. We hope you enjoy your Sunday afternoons with Alex, Andy, and the rest of the Space Talk crew. This is Steve Schaefer with your Sunday afternoon sports scoreboard. If your timepiece is right only twice a day, get down to Tim's Timepieces in Rice Village. The Tim's Timepieces time at the tone is... Need more junk in your life, space nerd? Sign up for the Space Junk newsletter at HoustonChronicle.com slash Space Junk. Roger that. Want to know more about Apollo and the moon landing? Mission Moon is a look back at how NASA shaped the world in Houston. Get all the special features at HoustonChronicle.com slash Mission Moon. People, culture, tech, and history behind the Apollo program. Little fun-sized nuggets of space nerdery. You dig? If you're loving this podcast, tell a friend about Cigarettes and Rocket Fuel. 
Help us spread the word. Tap those five stars for your pals at KHCN AM 4747. Those pals are Chronicle reporters Alex Stuckey and Andrew Dansby, Alex and Andy. Houston Chronicle Society reporter Amber Elliott is Miss Amber. Steve Schaefer is the newsman. The Chronicle's archivist is Joyce Lee. Scott Kingsley is the creator and producer. Staff artist Ken Ellis voices many of the ads. Designer Clarissa Rubio. Yoo-hoo, movie fans. Joined him for the Oscar contest ad again this week. We totally screwed up and forgot to credit her last week, so we'll say her name twice this week. Clarissa Rubio. Chronicle fashion editor Joy Sewing voiced the bell-bottom ad. She still can't believe there were pants for young men back then called Jam Jams. The Chronicle radio ad is from the late 60s, 1969-ish, let's say. Web producer J.R. Gonzalez somehow got a hold of a 45 RPM record with a collection of Chronicle jingles from back in the day. J.R. is the curator of HoustonChronicle.com slash Bayou City History, a trove of stories and photos and other groovy goodies from Houston's past. And, and, J.R. also voiced a station ID this week. Other IDs are by news researcher and show pages web producer, Leela Merrill, and by Howard Decker. Howard is our Director of Editorial Operations and News Systems, a title that describes a fraction of what he does around here. This week, Cigarettes and Rocket Fuel welcomes listeners in China, Iran, and Kenya, our first listener, or bot, in all of Africa. This little blue marble gets smaller all the time, man. Cigarettes and Rocket Fuel is a history podcast. We do not intend to glamorize the use of cigarettes any more than we condone the sexism and racism that existed in society and in newspaper pages in 1969. We hope cigarettes, sexism, and racism all become history one day. Our theme song, Crayola Girl, was created by Farrell Gibbs and produced by Brent Busby. If you'd like to know how that song came to be, Listen to Farrell's podcast, Unhand the Monster, Season 2, Episode 1. I'm Nancy Sarnoff, Chronicle real estate writer and host of Looped In, a podcast about Houston real estate, the dirt, the deals, the people, the places. Thanks for listening to Cigarettes and Rocket Fuel. Until next week, peace and love, y'all.